Well, good morning. Welcome to Vision, whether you're online or in-house. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's Christmas season around here. Hasn't our design team done a great job kind of taking us back? And um, it's really cool. It's, it's different. I was, I'll be honest with you. I was pretty concerned in our staff meetings. Like, I was like, what? No, no Christmas trees, no wreaths, no light. I mean, none of that stuff. And, and, and so we prayed and we talked and we saw it. And um, we said, hey, let's take us back this Christmas to Bethlehem, back to where Christmas began. And so uh, over the next few Sundays, you're going to see a lot more and hear a lot more. And so I'm really excited. Hey, let me just fill you in on what's happening next Sunday. Huge Sunday for our church. Uh, it is beyond Sunday, beyond the time where we get excited and we stretch. And we have one big offering that is totally focused on totally focused on expansion of the gospel. And so um, you're going to see people, and some of you are going to take tremendous steps of faith. You're going to put your faith in action next Sunday as we give to reach more people, not just here at Vision, not just here in the 919, but beyond, but beyond. And so I'm really excited to share a little bit more about that next week. So you get prayed up, you get filled up, and you get excited. We also, hey, <laughs> Next Sunday is in our kids' ministry is pancakes and pajamas. Okay, so here's <laughs> my staff kind of called me out in staff meeting because I said last Sunday that I might wear pajamas, and they said, No, you told the church you were, so you got to do it. And so that's right, there's going to be pancakes and pajamas, but also pastors in pajamas. Okay, and so um, I'm gonna bring the word, and so um, I'm probably going to have shoes on just because I think that's dirty and nasty if I don't. So, um, but you come, you have permission and, and freedom to do that. And, and don't worry, you won't be the only one, I promise. Um, and then also we are celebrating baptisms next Sunday. Who's excited about baptisms? Yeah. So, I, and look, I know, I know, I know there's people out there who have never taken their step of baptism or you've had that step taken for you. You say, what do you mean? Well, Maybe you didn't really have a choice, but you were baptized when you were younger and you didn't even know what was going on. But now you're a follower of Christ and you're like, should I? Should I? Look, I would love for you to talk to you about that. Um, and so go ahead and sign up on our app today uh, for Baptism Sunday, which is next Sunday. Lots happening next Sunday. And then the following Sunday is Christmas at Vision, two services, nine and 11. You come, you bring people, invite people. Um, the gospel is going to be presented in a very clear, practical, relevant way. And I, I believe that Jesus is going to save people's souls this Christmas. And um, so I get really excited about Christmas. You guys get excited about Christmas season. It brings a lot of anticipation, a lot of traditions. Um, but here's what I, <laughs> I don't get excited about. And look, I need you to take a breath because I'm going to be preaching on something that well, if you're new here, man, I, it seems like I preach on something every Sunday that kind of steps on people's toes. And it's really neat because it's not me. It's God who's challenging us and convicting us and growing us in areas. And this Sunday, I'm going to preach on something that, especially at this time of season, everything's heightened. Um, in fact, the average person, the average person, some of you are average and some of you are above, and then there's the rest of us like me, um, but the average person thinks about this particular thing 50% of their day, 50%. Yeah, I got y'all's attention. Yeah, I'm going to talk about money. I know, I know. If you're new here, like I'm kind of sorry, but not really, because, because God has a lot to say about money. And I figure if if I love Jesus and I love God and I love his word, then I can't just love the parts that I love. I got to love the parts of God and the parts of his word that I don't love, that challenge me and convict me and push me. And so let me just say this to begin with. Money matters. Anybody disagree with that? Like it, <laughs> Money is important. Um, money pays bills. Many of you, most of us eat because we have money. Most of us work 
for the wrong reasons, but we work to get money. Money matters. And how many of you know it's hard to live when you don't have money? But I'm here to tell you it's harder to live when money has you. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because here's reality. Here's what I believe. Here's what it, here's, you know this. You look at people today. Why are they working? Why are they trying to stop working and become insta-famous? Or, 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 uh, um, why, why are we trying to do what we need to do and get more? And ha- we want more. We want money. Money, money, money. M- more money means a better life. More money means I can do more and save more and have more in my kids and my future. And like, we want more. We're not ever satisfied. And God warns us. We're going to be in Luke 12, but I wanted to share this passage real quick from you from 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. Listen to these words, beginning in verse 6. You turn to Luke 12, and I'll have 1 Timothy 6 on the screen. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. Like some of you love your car, your truck. When you die, you're not going to have it anymore. You love the stuff we have, but we can't take it with us. If we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Paul's saying, listen, you get food and you get clothing. It looks like everybody has clothing, praise God. So all you got to do is be... You have to eat, which I'm pretty sure you're all eating. So with that, be content. But those who desire to be rich, notice it doesn't say those who are rich. It's those who desire to be rich. If you dream about wealth, we're going to make it big, baby, one day. We're going to get this and we're going to do this. And I can't wait till I climb the ladder of success. If that's your goal, then God says you're going to fall into temptation into a snare into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction and here it is highlight it get it tattooed wherever you need to put it up in the car in your house for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils If you love money, if you love it, you think about it all the time, you want it, it's kind of what you're going for and trying to get more. If that's you, if that's you, you got a problem. If that's me, I got a problem. People who love money will do anything to get it. They will cheat. They will lie. They will take advantage of the poor, of anyone. They will bribe, they will manipulate, they will steal. If you love money, you will do, listen to me, even pastors, even men of God, people of God, churches of God, if they love money, they will preach false things. They will tell you that you give and when you give, God will give you above and beyond and and they will present it in a way that makes you believe, number one, that you've got to give this stuff and if you don't, then then God is not happy with you and then when you give, if I give $10, God's going to give me 20 or 100 and they preach that. And sometimes that happens. I'm a testament to that. I'm a testament where I gave and I didn't have And God gave me back. But I've also given and I didn't have and I didn't get those finances back. So churches have done a bad job at this. And I'm sorry. Hey, listen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you have been hurt by churches who have manipulated, lied, abused, stolen, cheated. 
when it comes to finances. It's not right. The love of money. Do you know what this is called? This is a sin. This is greed. 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 Luke chapter 12. Someone in the crowd says to Jesus in verse 13. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Scholars tell us that older brothers in this day would manipulate and twist and try and take the younger brother's inheritance. So this is probably what was happening here. And the younger brother comes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, make, make my brother give me what's mine. Now, Jesus says, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, he said to the older brother, who the younger brother said is greedy. And he says to the younger brother, who Jesus knew was greedy. He says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, against all greed. Underline that. Be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus was saying this. Listen up. Not, not just you older brother, not just you younger, but all of you who are here. Listen to me right now. Watch out. Be on guard for greed. Because greed is sneaky. Like a cat. Like a cat. Jesus said, be on guard. Watch out for greed. You know, Jesus doesn't use this kind of language flippantly. He rarely says, watch out for this. This is one of the only times. For example, Jesus doesn't say, watch out, watch out, don't commit adultery. Why? Because you know if you're committing adultery, you're going to figure it out. Like it doesn't happen by accident. It's on purpose. Jesus doesn't say, watch out, don't, don't commit adultery. He says, watch out. Watch out for greed. Why? Because many people, maybe most of us in this room, are consumed with greed, but are blind to it. You know those blind spots when you're driving? There's certain, if you're not driving yet, you'll learn there's certain spots you can't see. So you, you've got blind spots. You have to physically turn and look. Some of us don't do that. I've ridden with some of you who don't do that. And it's very scary. But we have blind spots in our life. And greed is one of them. Don't you see it in America? You see greed in America? I'll prove it to you. Americans make more than four times the average person in the world. Listen, we spend 98% on ourselves. 98%. We spend more money on eating out than we do giving to charity. We spend more money on our animals than we do helping the poor. And we spend more money, Americans, on pornography than we do battling injustice and oppression. See, God, God designed us to enjoy people and use things. But we're, we're in a society that uses people and enjoys things. Why are we greedy? Is it because money's tight? I don't think so. During the Great Depression, during the Great Depression, no money anywhere. They were giving more. Americans were giving more percentage-wise to charity during the Great Depression than we are right now. Most of us think, if I just had more, I don't make enough. I don't make enough. And you would never say you're rich. I I ain't rich, Chris. I, I, I know. It. But if you have a car, if you have a car, you're in the top 3% of the richest people in the world. A household income of six figures puts you in the top half, top half of 1% of the wealthiest people in the world. But two-thirds of Americans who make six figures say they feel like they don't have enough. 
I think we're a little greedy. So what do we do when we don't feel like we have enough? Well, we get these beautiful pieces of plastic called credit cards. And these things are amazing because we can buy now and pay later or maybe never. Some people do that. And so now we have America filled with 77% of people who are in debt. 77%. I'm just saying we got a greed problem. Don't we? Can we just acknowledge that? I know that might be hard for you this morning. But we're kind of greedy. We're a greedy people. And Jesus says, watch out for this. It's, and, and, I know some of you are like, it's, it's, it's like Uncle Scrooge. Remember who's got a, a vault in his house filled with coins and riches. And we think that's the greedy person. But greed has nothing to do with how much you have. It has everything to do with what you do with what you have. So Jesus says, watch out. Watch out. In verse 16, he, he tells him a parable, a story. He says this, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. So you've got this rich man who's got like an abundance of wealth, crops. And he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? You understand what's happening? Stay with me. This is a good part of the story. Jesus is telling this story to, to people. And he's saying there was a rich man who was very wealthy, had a lot of crops, but he's running out of room to store it. And he said, I'm going to do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. I'm going to build bigger and better. I'm going to get more so I can have more. I'm going to have more so I can get more. In verse 19, and I'm going to say to my soul, so you have ample goods laid up for many years. So relax, eat, drink, and be merry. That's the American dream, by the way. Come on, let's recognize that. You're working hard right now. So one day you can relax, eat, drink, and be merry. We spend all our efforts pouring out into businesses, into practices, and, and, and we're, we're, we're pouring everything out. We're building up and we're consuming all so that we can retire and have money and go on vacations and have houses and not have to work anymore because work is bad even though God gave us work. God commanded us to work. Work is a good thing. It is a God thing. But we've turned it into an, a bad thing. An, almost an idol, if you will. And so we listen to that and we go, man, that guy's got it. He's figured it out. He's living the American dream. Who doesn't want that? I mean, I think we'd all be lying if we'd, we said it. When we turn 50 or 60 or 70 years old, if we could not work and have everything we want, that's the life, isn't it? Let me tell you what God thinks about that life. Verse 20. God says, fool. God said that? Mm-hmm. He said, fool. Fool. If you're living the American dream, if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're living this life with the pursuit of more, the pursuit of storing up in your barns, so you can have a big retirement, 401k, you can have, you've invested well, you're leaving stuff for whoever. God says, you're a fool. He says, this night... Your soul is required of you and the things you've prepared. Whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is the only time that I've found where God calls someone a fool. In other words, here's, here's what he's saying. If you take your paycheck that you earned last week or every two weeks or every month, or you take the amount of money you had for the year, and this is your attitude. I work hard for my money. It is my money. I can do with it what I want. I can spend it. I can save it. Chris, this is my money. I worked hard for this. I got to put up with a job. I got to put up with people, and I've worked. I'm tired. It's why I'm doing so I can have more. This is the way I'm going to manage my money. God says, you're a fool. You're a fool. And you're greedy. And this is what our culture is selling. 
It's why so many people are trying to be influencers. They're not trying to influence you for good, for God. They're trying to influence you so they can get rich. It's greed. It's greed. See, we treat life like Monopoly. Anybody like to play board games? Nobody? Oh. I thought I was, I knew I was weird, but I, okay. So, my family likes to play board games. Like, we just love it. And uh, we like, sometimes like to play Monopoly. Monopoly's a long game. What's the point of Monopoly? What's, get the most money, what else? Property. Basically, you have to get everything in order to win. We treat, mono- we, we treat our life like Monopoly. Some of us are playing Monopoly. You're living this life and playing Monopoly. I got to get more. I got to have more. I got to take more. If you, if you lose your stuff, if you lose boardwalk, eh, that's on you. Oh, you, you owe me. You're collecting. Jesus flips the script. He says your life should be less like Monopoly and more like Uno. You know Uno? Like, I love Uno. Reverse, reverse, right? You know, you know, I, lo- I love Uno. What's the point of Uno? The point of Uno is to get rid of all your cards. It's, it's to get rid of them. Nobody says, nobody who's playing Uno goes, oh, I can't wait. I'm going to get all the blues and all the yellows. I'm trying to get all the cards. If you do that in Uno, you're a fool. Right? Like, you you don't understand the point of the game. You don't understand the point of the game if you're trying to get all the cards. You're losing, and you don't even know it. Jesus says, wake up, wake up, wake up, church, wake up. Listen, some of you are, are living this life, and you are investing in your work, or in your family, or, or in stuff, and you can't stop shopping and spending, and you're doing all this stuff. He says, watch out, or you're a pastor or church leader, and trying to build these big churches, and do these big, incredible things, and you just want more, and more, and more, and Jesus says, watch out, you're a fool. You're blind to the greed that's in your heart. You don't understand the point of the life. It's not about getting. Man, it's about losing. Losing yourself. Giving your stuff. Helping others. And look, as you hear this, you're like, this dude's crazy. I get it, because this is not the norm. This is not what culture and this world has presented to us. But this is what God says. Jesus says, you better be living your life like Uno. Uno. I really, man, I I need to be better at this. I should have had an Uno card and given everybody an Uno card today. Okay, here we go. Now, Jesus says this in verse 22. Okay, so he's just taught this. He's still teaching it. And then he says to his followers, his disciples, therefore I tell you, all right, listen up, church. I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Hold up. We were just talking about greed, the love of money. And now you're telling me don't be anxious. He says, don't worry about it. What you'll eat nor about your body, what you will put on for the life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, the birds. They don't sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn and yet God feeds them. God takes care of the ravens. Isn't that pretty cool? Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? If then you are not able to do, so, do as a small a thing as that, then why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, the flowers, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, the, the wisest, richest man, Even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of the lilies. Really? But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, meaning grass is here one minute and gone the next. Like, look at the weather. 
Look at what it does. God's in charge of that. And Jesus says, if God clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow thrown in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Do not seek what you're to eat and what you're to drink, nor be worried. If you're anxious and worried, this is your passage. Highlight it. Mark it. He says, for the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, what do we do? Seek His kingdom, and these things will be added on you. Okay, so hold up. We're talking about greed. We're talking about money. We're, we're, I don't understand. Now, now we're talking about not being anxious, not worrying. It doesn't seem like it goes together. But that's the whole point. That's why this passage is here. There is a direct connection between greed and worry. One of the top things people in America are worried about, money. Some people worry about death and how to pay for the money, how to pay for it. 77% are worried about their finances. I need you to hear me. If your mind is full of worry, if you're anxious, if you're afraid, listen to me. When your heart is full of greed, your mind is full of anxiety. This goes beyond money. Greed is not just money. Greed is this idea, I want more. I need more. I got to have more. Worry is that you are afraid you don't have enough. The two go hand in hand. And Jesus says, if you got a greedy heart, man, you got an anxious mind. And I'm here, Jesus says, to solve this for you. Let me, can I talk to you who are financially anxious today? Those of you who are a little greedy financially, you don't have to admit it. But, and believe me, I know my wife, y'all pray for her, she's sick, real sick. She's going to the doctor at 12, um, but just pray for her. But I'm kind of, I don't know if she's listening or not, but maybe she's not, because this, this message is for me. I just know it, I'm, I'm kind of glad she's not right here right now. If you, if you, if you're greedy, or you're financially anxious, right? You're worried about the future or worried you, how you're going to pay this or do that. Okay, let me say this. Most people live at the limit of their money. Do you understand what I mean by that? If you make $1,000 a week, guess how much you're going to spend? Actually, you would say maybe 1000 Actually, studies, studies show that Americans spend $1.26 for every dollar they make. That's why we're in debt. We're living at the limit. We're working just to pay bills and debt. We can't enjoy it. And it's no wonder we're anxious living paycheck to paycheck. It's anxiety place to live at your limit. Jesus says, if you seek my kingdom first, invest in God, you're rich towards God. You won't you won't be worried. You won't be anxious. You'll have less anxiety. So here's the pushback. I know some of you are thinking this. Are you kidding me? I won't make anything. You're telling me I got to put God first? And, and, and I'm barely making it, Chris. Like I got bills. There's no way. Somehow I'm supposed to take something and be rich toward God? I can't afford it, right? Have you ever said that? I can't afford to tithe. I can't afford to give. I'd really like to help, but I can't afford it. Have you ever said that? I, I, I've been debating whether to share this. Y'all around here, like, you never know what I'm going to say in terms of confessing. And I think that's a beautiful thing. 
have to be wise in that too. But I'll be honest with you. I hope I'm not fired after this. You know when that Powerball thing went up to like $2.2 billion? There was a part of me that was like, okay, God, I'm going to play this. And if you give it to me, I'm going to just unload on your kingdom. We are going to do some amazing things. So I played. Just just a little baby bit. I played. That's what we do with sin, by the way. Just a little baby bit. Not going to hurt me that much. I played. I did not win. I know. I would, <laughs> I'm telling you. I say that I would satisfy all your debt. Like I would. But here's reality. Come on. Listen to this. There are more people who've committed suicide that have won the lottery than have given it away. Did you know that? There are more people who've gone bankrupt than have given it away. So while we say, if I make more, I would give more. Let me tell you something. If you're not faithful with the little, you will not be faithful with much. Don't you dare. Don't you dare say, God, I will obey when. And that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. Obedience is a right now decision. Jesus, Jesus is saying to us right now, he, with love and compassion, you don't need more money. I don't like to hear that. But just feel that. Jesus is saying, you don't need more. You need to invest in my kingdom. My people. My church. Invest. And look, not just financially, right? Your time. Your job. Your family. It all is for God's kingdom. Parents, you are raising up little Christs, or you're not. What are you doing with the blessings that God has given you? You're trying to make sure they study hard and, and so they can have the most and get them involved in everything and do it because you didn't have those opportunities. Are you pouring prayers over them? Are you keeping them in God's word, in God's church, around God's people? Or are you demonstrating what it looks like to be a godly wife or a godly husband or a godly parent? This is your responsibility. This is how you invest in God's kingdom with your kids. What are you showing them when, when you, when you, when you, prioritize other things over God. Jesus says, when you prioritize me and my kingdom and my church, you will be less worried. You will be less anxious. And it will free you from the freedom. It will free you from the guilt of greed. That's what it will do. Because you will no longer spend at your limit. Because if you do, you're going to end up where this guy does. A total loss. A total loss. He goes on and says, fear not in verse 32. Little flock. I'm going to start calling you all the little flock. Fear not, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Here it is, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Don't miss this. This is the biggest idea that you need to take away, that I need to take away. Where your money goes signifies where your heart is. That's not me. That's Jesus. What you are investing in. That's where your heart is. 
if we talk about money, look at your bank account. Like, pull it open this week and look at what you spend and what you invest in and where you save. And then look at how much you prioritize being rich in God and his kingdom and his church to, to reach people with the gospel. How much you give away. And that's crazy, I know. But God says, I'm flipping this thing upside down. And you, I will actually do more with less. And for you logical people, the people that has to make sense in your brain, this is blowing your mind. I get it. I get it. But you know why, you know why we don't do this, right? The reason we don't give, the reason we aren't generous the reason we want to collect and get more and play Monopoly, let's call it what it is. It's a lack of faith. It just is. We don't really believe what God says. It's why some of you don't tithe. You don't believe it. You don't even see how it will work. And so you choose not to. And when I win the lottery, I will give. When I make more, I will give. We don't really believe this, do we? We just don't. Because if we did, if we were certain, if we were certain this is true, you would all do it. We would do it. I would do it every single time. I would give. When I get paid, I would look to give it away. Man, I long for the day. God is my witness. I long for the day where I can give to God more than I can give to me and this world. Because of my foolish spending and, and my debt and all this, like I'm not able to give what I can give. And it has held me captive, y'all. I surrendered last week. It's held, I don't get this right every time. But I'm, I'm, God is growing my generosity towards him, toward, towards you, towards the church. The reason I want to hold is because I'm looking at my bank account and my bills and thinking of the future, and I think to myself, this isn't going to work. And it's a lack of faith. It's a lack of trusting in God's word. If I truly believe this, I would, I would, there would be no question that I would live this way. It's like this. Is Brandon in here? So, hey, there's Brandon back there. Brandon, I remember like three or four years ago, Bitcoin. And Brandon was like, man, you got to invest in this. And like, he's telling me about all this Bitcoin stuff. And it's like blowing my mind. I'm like, I, I don't get it. Well, I don't know, Brandon. And so like, I'm thinking Brandon's weird. I ain't, I ain't going to do this. Like, he's crazy, right? Okay. You don't understand what Bitcoin is like cryptocurrency. You can't see it, but it's there. And, and actually you can buy things with it now. And it's the way of tomorrow, right? And so if you believe that, you're going all in. Does that make sense? Okay, now listen. If Brandon somehow went to the future... And then came back and said, Chris, I'm right. I saw it, man. And I knew that he went. I knew it. He's like, you need to get rid of all your paper money now. Invest in Bitcoin. And if I truly believed him, what would I do? I'd invest in Bitcoin. I'd get rid of all my money and go with Bitcoin. That makes sense to everybody? Why? Because I have future information that I know is going to be worth exponentially more. You with me? Wake up. Jesus came to the earth from heaven with future information. He says, right now, go ahead and eat, go ahead and work, go ahead and live, go ahead and clothe yourselves. Because one day you will die. And everything that you spent, invested in, will be laid out. And it'll either be something you managed for me and my kingdom and you stewarded well. Or something that just fades away. I'm not trying, look, I'm not trying to guilt you or convict you or, or pressure you or even challenge you. I was supposed to be a financial analyst. Don't make a lot of sense. But I was supposed to be a financial analyst. And what I'm telling you right now is the best financial advisor, Jesus Christ, has told us how we are to invest. And it is in him and his kingdom and his people and his 
church. And he says, anything you give investing in me and my kingdom to reach people with the gospel, you will be, it'll be returned to you hundredfold. I mean, exponentially. And it may not be right here so you can buy stuff. It may be in heaven, but it will be a blessing. Anybody you reach with the gospel, they'll be in heaven and they'll, they're going to come to you. The Bible says, and they will, they will love you and say, thank you so much. Like, thank you for sending that missionary. Thank you for telling me. Thank you, thank you for feeding me. It's as simple as you see a homeless person and you don't think the worst. You assume the best. Love assumes the best. And you help them in Jesus' name. Jesus sees your heart. It's not your responsibility to tell them what to do with that. Jesus says there's an eternal reward every time you help somebody. In my name. Every time you share the gospel. Every time you prioritize me. Right now you're taking time to be here. To invest in each other. To listen. To worship. That's, there's an eternal inheritance for you. So what does this look like practically? Okay, real quick. And I'm done. Number one. If you are a follower of Jesus. Okay. So that eliminates some. So you don't have to listen if that's not you. But if that's you. Like you've loved Jesus, you've given him your life. Then you need to connect to a local church and regularly invest and contribute to Christ's mission. Regularly. Some of you are really good at dating the church. You know what I mean? Like you like this church's voice and you like this church is how they handle kids and you like this, this church is pastor. And so we date a lot of churches without ever committing and connecting. How greedy are we? You're looking for a church for you. Not even what you can invest in and what you can share and what you can do and what God like. It's all about you. So you need to connect. And you need to regularly invest there. Financially, with your time, with your prayers. So here's what Mandy and I do. We tithe. Now, I'm just telling you, there's a lot of messed up teaching on the tithe. This was an Old Testament tax, to be honest with you. It was more than 10%. It's really closer to 23%, maybe upwards to 30%. It was a temple tax. There is mention of tithing in the New Testament. The tithe, though, for Mandy and I, and I'm, maybe I'll give a message later on that. But the tithe, for me, is a standard. It's an accountability. The, the word tithe actually means tenth. So I want to tell you what I do, just so you know. Very transparent. When I get paid, it's not paid day, it's tithe day. I get paid immediately. First, first fruits, first fruits, 10%, at least 10% goes to God, to his church. I tithe to God through the church. That's how I do that. That money's not yours, it's God's, but I give it through my local church. I figured, and Mandy and I prayed about it, if God in the Old Testament if the tithe was there, and it's a tenth, then I figured that's a good standard to start with. Because I need accountability. Like, this doesn't come naturally. So I could say, eh, I don't have to tithe, I'll just give to God. But the truth is, I won't. So Mandy and I do that every time we get paid. Why do we do it first? Because God doesn't want my sloppy seconds. My house isn't more important than God. His house is more important than my house. And I trust him. I give to him. I trust him. Here's the second thing. As the Holy Spirit leads, give offerings to God. We declare with our money who our master is. So I give to anything that helps spread the gospel. So every time I drive by a homeless person and I feel led by the Holy Spirit, that's key, right? Like I'm not going to be guilted. Because they look cute and they have a family. 
I'm going I'm to be led by the Holy Spirit. And when he prompts me, I roll down the window, and the first thing I ask is, hey, what's your name? How did you get here? Can I pray with you? And then I give him money. Because that's my gospel opportunity. I've invested in you. Some of you I've given to, supported. Offerings. Some of us support missionaries, right? As a church, we've done this. As individuals, you've done this. Like offerings are above and beyond. We, some of us volunteer at nonprofits. Some of us go to the Dream Center and serve, right? Like this, this is how we do it. This is how we invest in God's kingdom. When we go and help someone, when we buy groceries for someone who can't, when we, when we go get their, I mean, whatever we do in the name of Jesus, but we don't just do kind acts. We always point to the gospel, right? Good deeds don't save people. Jesus Christ does. So I'm glad that you can help people. But if you're not sharing the gospel, Jesus Christ, your story, then you're not being obedient. Do good, but share the gospel. I want to thank people in this church who've invested in me over the years. A lot of you know, but some of you don't. I'm going to Israel in March. And I'm scared to death. Like most pastors go, yo, I'm so excited. Like I am excited, but I'm, I'm nervous. Not about flying, not about dangers over there. It's just, I'm going to be in a in foreign land. And some of you have in, invested in me, generously gave. And I appreciate that. You know, you don't ever, you'll never know how much that means to me. Mandy and I. In 2023, here's what we committed to. It's scary, but on top of our tithe, we're going to give a certain percentage away. So every time we get paid, we're going to take a certain percentage of that, put it in a little uh, place, and say this is our uh, offering money. And so anytime we feel led by the Holy Spirit to give to someone or something or, or you know, whatever, we do that. We've already started. We didn't wait till 2023. Well, how much should we do? Look, look. You know this is not about an amount, right? It's about your heart. Remember the, the widow? She gave one coin. <laughs> it's heart posture. The good news is, and I promise you this, the more generous you are, the more greed's grip gets released. God doesn't want or need your money. He's after your heart. He's after your heart. And where your treasure is, there's your heart. So as we step into beyond this week, I want you to pray. Some of us need to fast. Some of you have never done that. And uh, if you're curious about what that looks like, I can talk to you. we got resources available. But you pray about what what God's asking you to do. Some of you need to begin tithing. Like that's just a good standard for you. Maybe that's an easy thing for some of you. God's not really stretching you in this area. It's not because he doesn't want to. And if you can't trust vision or me with your, and I say your, with God's money, Find a church or a people of God or a missionary, someone that you feel confident in and give to God. Not to them because you like them. Give to God. Greed. It's not easy to see. Let me pray. Father, now you speak. You continue to convict and challenge us, God. This is a... You, you talk a lot about money, so I feel like it's important. And I know that I wouldn't be loving. I wouldn't be a good pastor if I didn't preach your word and your truth. So I pray now the Holy Spirit does something I cannot. I want to talk to you who are Christians right now. Those of you who are followers of Jesus. Are you greedy? Are you greedy? Here, here's, what I, here's what I want to challenge you with. Some of you are greedy financially. You believe in the scarcity mindset. You don't have enough. 
You need to make more. You, you don't know. Here's the bottom line. You don't trust God. This is the area that he wants to grow your faith. And it starts right now. Some of you have no problem being generous, being obedient, and worshiping God with your finances. But you're greedy with your relationships. Hey, you're dating right now, and you are so focused on you and how she makes you feel or what he makes you feel that you have lost sight of why God wants two people together. It's not about you. How about in your marriage? You expect your wife to do everything. You expect your husband to make all the money. Whatever it is. But like you're being greedy. You're looking out for you. And when they don't make you feel a certain way, you make them feel bad. How selfish are you? Wake up. Greed. 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 Invest in his kingdom. Stop trying to build yours. Your marriage is not for you. It is for God and for the other person. Start living that way. Selflessly. Some of you, your work is the most important thing because it's the thing that gives you money. That's a greed problem if that's your mentality. If you spend more hours at work than you do investing in people, investing in your family, investing in your church, then you got, a, you got a greed problem. How about your time? Are you greedy with your time, Christian? You come to church when you want to. You, you really won't be in a life group because everything else is taking pre precedence. You won't serve because you just don't want. Look, you're greedy. It's all about you. Listen, I'm just saying there's a lot of Christians today who are consumers. We're saved and we love God, but we're still looking out for number one. Today we repent. We lay our greed down and we say, God, I want to invest in you and your kingdom. This altar will be open. You need to run down here. Repent of your greed. Now, I want to talk to one more type of person here. One type of person who's greedy with their life. Your life is all about you. Look at the way, look at the things you think about nonstop. Look at the way you spend your life. Look at your patterns. Look at your behaviors. In fact, nobody's going to tell you what to do because it is your life. That's your mentality. Let me tell you something right now. In the most loving way I can. Your greed is blinding you to true life. The truth is, we're sinners. We don't meet God's standard. The standard is perfection. So, we're hopeless. When we die because of our sin... We will not be in heaven. We will be in hell. If you die. And it is your life. And you are in control. And you are the Lord. And you are living for you. And, and you're greedy. And you have no room for God. But God. But God. In his love. Compassion. Mercy. And grace. Sent Jesus Christ his son to the earth. To die in your place. For your sin as your sin. And he did that. He lived a perfect life. He hung on a cross and died a death that you and I were supposed to experience in our place. But the amazing thing is three days later he came back to life. Supernaturally. To prove that he is God. And the Bible says that. If you repent of your sin, you turn from sin and turn to God and call on the name of the Lord Jesus for salvation. Then you will be saved. In other words, stop being greedy. Lay down your life and take Christ. That's it. That's a winner. That's how to invest. That's how to be saved. Some of you have never done it. You've tried, you've tried, but let's be honest, you're just greedy. And today, right now, you're going to surrender. You're going to lay your life down and say, take my greed, God. I repent and I turn to you. I call on Jesus for salvation. If that's you right now on the count of three, I just want you to slip your hand up. That's it. One, two, three. Just slip your hand up right now. Yeah, I see you. Anybody else? I see you. Anybody else? Anybody else? 
Anybody else? I saw you back there. Yep. Okay. Now listen to me. We're going to pray. There's not going to be any singing. There's going to be some playing right here. And I need greedy people to come forward and repent. If you, if you want to be saved today and, and you're realizing that you need Jesus, those of you who raised your hand, listen to me. This is the most important decision that you'll ever make right now. Right now, when, when we start coming forward, you need to get up and you need to come and find Pastor Rod or you need to find someone on this side. They will be willing to pray with you this morning and just walk you through what that looks like. It's not scary. This is the biggest and best decision. Stop being greedy. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that your people would repent this morning, that lost people would be found. I pray for faith, encouragement, and boldness for those who raise their hand today. I pray they don't look at anybody else in this room, but they look to you, God, and they don't care about the opinions of anyone else, but they take those steps of obedience and say, I surrender to you today. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? This altar is open. This altar is open. Just repent today. Just repent. You come. Father, we thank you for this word. <clears throat> thank you for heart change. We thank you for your blood that covers all of us. I pray that we as a church be a giving church. Not just in our finances, but in our life, in our time, and in, in, in every area of us, Lord. I pray that we just give abundantly for your glory. We love you and we thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, you guys have been empowered by the Spirit this morning. Go out, love Jesus, love people, and live your purpose. Love you guys. We'll see you next week. <laughs>